Hello, good evening. Welcome to the late news on TV3, live from the News Hub at Adesawa in Kanda, Accra. We're also live on your DSTV channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Asari. Tonight, we look back into time 12 months after the first kidnapping and tell the story of the police level of professionalism and if something different could have been the case. But before then, let's do the highlights. The Ablekuma West Assembly is to begin construction of storm drains at Begbeise after the successful demolition of houses along Jegu Lagoon. The decision of the Assembly followed persistent calls from the inhabitants of the area, urging the Assembly to complete what it has started. Led by Ni Adote Familite, the residents vowed to take over the demolished area if the Assembly failed to fulfill its mandate. Also, management of the University of Ghana Medical Center has set November 1 this year to start full operation and remain open to the public. The center currently runs only three OPD clinics, including pediatric clinic, the OPS and gynecology. And Teachers at Kremo Chrome Basic School in Dama East battle privacy as many as 13 share just two rooms. But teachers at Kremo Chrome were not alone in this situation. Authorities say lack of teacher accommodation is widespread in the district. And traditional leaders of Nauri in the Kbandai districts of the northern region have for the first time called on the overlord of Dagbo Yana Abukari Mahama to pay homage to him. The historic maiden visit in 80 years of the existence of the Nauri kingdom aimed at strengthening relationships. On the international front, Sudan's ruling military council and civilian opposition alliance have signed a landmark power sharing deal. The agreement ushers in a new governing council, including both civilians and generals, to pave the way towards civilian rule. Under the deal, a sovereign council consisting of six civilians and five generals will run the country until elections. Let us now do the big one. In a big one tonight, exactly a year today, the kidnapping of the second Takrada girl who will be known as the first of three kidnapped girls happened. Prisla Blessin Bintoum, 21 years of age, would become one of the three faces that represented a crime that would go into the annals of the Ghanaian crime history. She will become one of three faces that will tell the story of the many angles on the issue of a national culture and perception of crime and how it should be dealt with. Today on News at 10, we look back into time 12 months after the first kidnapping and tell the story of the police level of professionalism and if something different could have been the case. So let's stay a while longer on this story and look at what has happened over the time and then to where we presently are. So August 15, 2018, 16-year-old senior high school student kidnapped about 100 meters from a house at New Site in Takrade. August 17, 2018, two days after that, 21-year-old lady kidnapped at Inkwafol Junction, also in the Sikani Takrade metropolis. And December 4, 2018, a group of unidentified men who posed as workers of mobile telecom giant MTN Ghana kidnapped an 18-year-old lady in Takrade. December 21, 2018, 15 year old Priscilla Mantebia Kranche, first year student of secondary college, was kidnapped. Suspect Nigerian Sam Udotwak Wills was rearrested after breaking out of police custody. It did not end there.
Because January 23, 2019, Eugene Kweku Jamina, a, a form three pupil of the Bishop Iswa JHS in Takra, they went missing. Eugene was found dead at Monkey Hills, a forest reserve in the Takra area. An examination of the diseased body revealed no cuts. Now looking at the timelines of the kidnapping, it's been 365 days since Prisla Bentum was kidnapped. So exactly a year, 4th December, Ruth Love Crazy, and that gives us 256 days. And then 239 days now for Prisla Crunchy, who was kidnapped on 21st December 2018. Summer Wolves was rearrested on December 22, 2019. But even as we continue to refresh your minds on this, we know that along the line, some two Canadian girls were also kidnapped. And just after two days, they were rescued. We also know that some human remains have also been found, which people was there's this speculation as well that they are the remains of the girls. And then there was also, or there's also a call on the police CID boss to also resign because there's a public opinion that she has not really done well, especially we're coming out to give the information that they know where the girls are and then later they find out they don't know where the girls are. So it's been a lot of issues spanning from the first day of the kidnap up until now. But the good thing is that security analyst Sani Adib has joined us in the studio to help us in discussing this more. Thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on your um, graduation. We Thank saw the you. pictures all over the place. Congratulations. So you. Um, you have been following this issue for a while and it's been a year. Along the line, what have you observed? Um, well, it's been a rude awakening for the, the people of Ghana and from all indication and from uh, our analysis gotten from empirical facts gathered from a series of researches we've, con we've conducted on the ground point to the fact that we're not actually ready for it. Our uh, security architecture protocols, everything was designed towards combating other crimes like armed robbery, domestic violence, etc. But uh, we were confronted with shock with the spate of kidnapping in the country. Unfortunately, we're not prepared enough for raids and uh, generally also it, also it boils to the fact that Ghanaians are not very conscious of their security environment that mm. is why some of us have been extremely vociferous about the need for some level of awareness to be created especially amongst the population so we all uh, together can work towards maintaining better security in the country. Mm -hmm. And to add up to the issue of shock, interestingly, we don't even seem to have enough uh, negotiators within the police service. I understand the fourth victim, the 19-year-old Ruth, when she was taken the police were literally bargaining with the kidnappers as if they were buying clothing, which I don't think should have been done that way. Mm. It should it have, have been, been conducted that by... No, no, it should have been even been conducted by highly qualified, trained, experienced negotiators. Mm. You know, so that could have helped to a very large extent. Secondly, I understand the bargaining lasted for a period of time. So if we had the uh, technical know-how and the equipment, I'm sure we would have been able to, to use trick. basic technology, exactly. such as uh, 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 base stations or LBS to track the location of the kidnappers. Unfortunately, mm. that's not what that. happened. And to further even cause so much anxiety to Ghanaians. The, the ladies, the girl, the 19-year-old Ruth, her ID card was used to register for mobile money for some money to even be transferred, transferred. to the kidnappers. Mm. So I, I would want to take this advantage to appeal to parents, look, God forbid, but anytime you find yourself in such a situation, you need to exercise some level of discretion. Please, Report to the police. Don't try to negotiate with the kidnappers. And don't send any money. Mm. No, in some cases, it might even worsen the case. Yeah, so the, the, the discussion right now is that people are trying to blame the police for not bringing finality to this issue after a period of a year. Do you think that is why we should be putting the blame now? Well, to a very large extent, uh, we have every reason to bl blame the police, especially the police leader leadership. 
um, partly because of their inability to work towards enhancing the skill sets of the police in investigation. Uh, I've said it over and over again. I've spoken with CID officers who contend that uh, over 70% of the processes involved in investigation is manual in mm. 21st century. And uh, our inability to also have uh, a digitalized way of fighting crime is also something that is worrying. When you go to other jurisdictions, they use DNA technology, they use genealogy, which yeah. is an advanced form of DNA technology, uh, fingerprints, database, etc., to fight crime. And it's really helping. Mm -hmm. And I'm particularly very saddened by our, our inability to also work on situational crime prevention. That is creating an environment where crime would be a disincentive to commit okay. to criminals in the first place. And that happens when criminals have a reason to believe that if I perpetrate this crime, the likelihood that I'll be arrested or prosecuted uh, is very high. Of course, they will be disincentivized from even to going go into, into it in the more. first place. Unfortunately, um, a lot of things happen in the, in the country, especially crimes involving average Joe persons like you and I, who are not perhaps affiliated to big men, politicians, <laughs> MPs, and nobody gives credence to it. Yeah. But once it involves a relative or a foreign national uh, of, or a relative of a politician, it becomes a high profile, and that is when we give it the attention it deserves. It deserves. But I think going forward, in order to uh, um, uh, ensure some build-up of confidence uh, in the police amongst the general public, they need to give credence to every case that is reported mm. uh, uh, to the police. And the police, like I indicated, should be trained more. In Ghana, we've always had a b reason to believe when you see someone dangling on a tree with, you know, from a tree with a rope around his neck, he's it's committed suicide. suicide. No, please. I mean, God forbid, but someone can kill another person and, and stage that it that way. Yeah. You know, do we train them? Do we do we have body farms in Ghana? When you go to other jurisdictions, they place cadavers in the open field and subject it to some analysis over a long period of time. Mm. Because the way the body even lies down at the scene, a, an expert can tell whether this is a suicide or whether this is murder. It's, 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 and sometimes yeah. animal activities and even the activities of bacteria and other environmental, external Agents things that, and affect, all that yeah. can change a body from a suicide posture to a murder posture or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Do we train them through all of these processes? I think that, that's another discussion that we have to have on this one. But we, over the time, we've said that security is a shared responsibility, the police and then civilians. What do you think these two parties got wrong from the side of the police as well as the side of the family? Apart from the fact that they went ahead to do the negotiation to think they would have been able to get their girls back. What other things went wrong well, with these two parties? Sometimes I don't blame the families completely because uh, a lot of them don't have any reason to believe in the police. Um, I have spoken with a number, a lot of victims of crime who tell me that, look, I don't report to the police to what end, what would come of it, you, you understand? So that lack of trust is what is breeding uh, uh, some of these inefficiencies. But generally, I think there's a need for, like I indicated earlier, some level of awareness to be created amongst the general population. We are mm -hmm. not we are not we are not alert, we are not vigilant in our communities. When you see some strange people move in rent, drive uh, unregistered vehicles, don't work during the day, work only at night, at night. you have every reason to suspect <laughs> something is amiss. Yeah. You know? So we should uh, uh, how about that uh, what do we call it? Uh, that that, that uh, attitude of reporting certain cases to the police. And the police, on the other hand, should fulfill their part of the bargaining by, by providing people who give them critical information some level of security. security. Uh, many people fear, you know, when I report to the police, the next minute everybody in the area would know yeah, I'm the concern. Yeah. You know, but the <laughs> witness protection regime is something that we should really be working uh, at seriously. Generally, the police, there's a lot of work to be done within the police mm. service. I mean, I've spoken with some police officers who tell me that when there are even papers to write statements when people come in, it's a problem. It's a challenge. Uh, uh, and I'm hoping that the new IGP will take it upon himself to invest more in training the technical capacity of, of improving the technical capacity of the police to mm -hmm. investigate crime in the country and, of course, to provide them with the requisite uh, uh, materials and logistics need. they would need to 
do the work with. So before I let you go, we're at a point where we've picked DNA samples from the family of the girls to ascertain whether the human remains found are that of the girls. There's lots of um, apprehension, I mean, all over the country. How would you suggest we go about dealing with the issue while we await the results of the DNA? Well, men lie, women lie, but facts don't. Uh, DNA is something that you cannot play politics with. I've always said that even if it lasts, if the bones last over a million years, you can retrieve DNA from it, especially from the longest part, from the longest bones in the body. That's the femur mm -hmm. and the humerus. So uh, we can only wait with bated breath. But okay. a lot of mistakes were done with uh, communicating some mm -hmm. of the issues to the public. And the normal circumstance in crisis situation, the police should have had um, an officer with some communication background to serve as the liaison officer between the police and the families of the girls. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. And uh, there was a lot of inconsistency and incoherence uh, okay. with the communication. And that is what has resulted in that mistrust that has built up over uh, the period with respect to the families of the girls. So I think communication is extremely key. Mm -hmm. uh, Sometimes it is not always necessary to give a commentary of what happens I to the public. I was coming to that. You no. know, the, the CID boss says that we calling for a resignation is not really what is needed now. She only came out to give us hope that they know where the girls are. Do you think she should have come out to say that they know where the girls are? And then did you think she should have even responded to the fact that she doesn't need to resign? We don't have to call for her resignation. She, she, I, sometimes, with all humility, I mean, she speaks like she's not a professional. Because for crying out loud, I think it is in an attempt that she, in an attempt to please the public and to some extent, the politicians that they were really on the job they, they were they really knew what they were doing that they hastily organized that news conference mm -hmm. and that has rather deteriorated everything because it has rather even opened widened the gap more between the people and the police who already don't even trust in the police so for mm -hmm. the police to come out to say we know where the girls are and they'll be coming home they are safe the next minute you say something different rather than keep quiet, you're again coming out to say you going is not going to solve anything. I think that is unfortunate because okay. um, in, in crime and investigation, in communication is extremely key. Mm. That can make or unmake make the case. The case. All right, Sunny Adid is a security analyst helping us to take a lot more about a year on after the first kidnap case was recorded here in Ghana. We're back with more stories after this break. Don't go away. Welcome back. This is News at 10 on TV3. Teachers who are giving training towards the implementation of the revised kindergarten curriculum for KG1 and KG2 Saturday afternoon embarked on a demonstration at the TI Amadia Senior High School Centre in Kumasi. In Kumasi, the teachers numbering over 100 at the T.I. Hamadiya Senior High School Centre expressed their displeasure over the paltry allowance for the curriculum training. According to them, they were yet to receive 100 CDs for allowance and transportation, but only given 50 CDs at the end of the one-week training. Some of the teachers were holding placards with the inscription, Teachers are bread. They also raised concerns about the quality of food served them. Some aggrieved teachers spoke to TV3. Uh, we were made to understand that we'll be getting 50 cities for TNT and 50 cities for allowance. City allowance. And 
we were in the classroom when one of the metro um, officers came and told us that they were going to give us only 50 cities, which is cheating. So we don't, we don't want it. Oh, the food was not anything to take home. So depressed. We are not happy. They have taken us for granted for so long. This time teachers we build, teachers we buy cars, teachers we buy petrol, we do anything. So now these people can cheat us. The Ghana Education Service, GES, and the National Council for Curriculum Assessment recently launched a new curriculum which will be used in the Ghanaian schools in the 2019 and 2020 academic year. That's how we end tonight's edition of the news on TV3, which is also live on DSTV channel 279. My name is Grace Hamwa Asari. Log on to 3news.com and get some other stories. Good evening.